Josh, thank you so much for being here, man. I know you're a busy guy uh, out there in Ohio, I believe, right? Yep. Yep. Um, so we record the meeting uh, because we have members who can't make you know, this live Zoom call, so they'll watch the recording later, but we have a few people on here excited to meet with you today. Thank you for coming. Um, what we normally, what we kind of find that works really well with our guests is to have you talk about yourself and your story uh, for 15 minutes, give or take. I mean, not, that's not a hard rule. Kind of mm -hmm. take us from when you first found out about running a business or being an entrepreneur or real estate, kind of where your mindset developed and then all the way up through today. And then you can tell us, you know, what are your future goals? What do you want to accomplish in the next five, 10 years? Um, and then after that's done, I usually have some questions to kind of fill in some holes perhaps, or, and then we go to Q and A with the members The members will ask you questions and you can fill them in. So I want to introduce Josh though. Uh, Josh and I connected because of uh, Chase Lowry, I believe, right, Josh? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Who was, is a Sheik's Freaks member and Chase reached out to me and said, Hey, I know this guy, Josh. Um, he should be a guest on Cheek Streaks. And so I met with Josh on a Zoom call a couple months ago, and I was like, yeah, let's have him on. So what impressed me is Josh is very young. I want to say 21-ish? 22. 22. Close. So you're old. Yeah. Never mind, you're old. <laughs> uh, so he's yes. very much you know, the age of a lot of the members in this group. This group is 15 to 25. And Josh, just a reminder for you, Geeks mm -hmm. Freaks is a mastermind or a community of 15 to 25 Gen Zers who are highly interested in, most of them are interested in real estate, uh, but entrepreneurship, frugality, side hustles, mindset, early financial freedom, uh, all of the stuff that kind of goes with that, right? Uh, side, uh, starting small businesses. So um, Josh is 22. I think he's been a real estate agent for just over a year and has done a ton of deals. Um, I learned a little bit about how he did that when we met, but I, I'm looking forward to learning more now. We do have a, a good number of members who either are agents or want to be agents. And we have even more who are thinking, should I become a real estate agent or should I not? Because most of our members are interested in investing. And most of them are thinking of doing house hacking. And some of them are doing house hacking. We have, I think, three or four on this call that, that actually have a property right now and are house hacking one and Taylor's got two. Uh, and so I think a lot of them are going to be interested in what you have to say about, you know, how you are investing, how you're succeeding as a real estate agent and, and anything that kind of goes along with that. So um, members, as he's talking, if you think of questions, write them down, jot them down, um, remember them because, you know, you'll have a chance to ask those questions. Um, all right, Josh. So yeah, just tell us a little bit about, a little bit about who you are and what you've been up to. For sure. Yeah, this is, uh, I guess I haven't really like formally told my story. So forgive me if it's not as smooth as it could be, but, um, I've always kind of been like an entrepreneur. I've run a lot of businesses. So like when I was younger, I used to, um, uh, make like wallets out of duct tape and sell those in like fifth and sixth grade and to try to stack up some money. I've always been very frugal. I don't really buy anything. Um, like when I was a kid, I didn't really like try to, I don't know, buy new shoes, buy new clothes. I always saved because I was like, I know there's something that I can do that's more productive with this. I just don't know it yet. So I'm saying that now because that's kind of been my mindset over the years as I've grown, because I've learned how to actually apply some of that capital and some of the things that I learned. So I did take some notes so I can get everything correct. Um, so like my initial goal was I wanted to be able to subsidize my living expenses by the time I was 30. Um, so that's what I always wanted. So in uh, high school, I used to sell shoes. I ran a company called Cleveland Souls. Um, I would sell to, I got to the point where I was selling to athletes, like Cavs players, NBA players. I sold to Migos. It was pretty cool. Um, 
I learned a little bit about that industry. So, and it was hard, it was hard to not, you know, not want to buy all the shoes for me, but it was kind of fun. Um, so I did that in high school, did that for like four years. So I saved up some money from that. And then at the end of high school, I went to Miami, Ohio, which is a public school in, in, in Ohio. And I was studying computer science and I knew I'd have like a higher income job from that because most, most of them do, but I didn't really want to do that my whole life because I felt like it was going to be, I don't know, boring. And I know I could get financial freedom that way, but it would have taken, you know, a good 10, 15, 20 years of living on a very small proportion of your income and paying very high tax rate. So taking all into account, I knew that there had to be like a more productive path than doing that, but I didn't have any other ideas or I didn't have a better strategy at the time. So I was pursuing that until I found something better. So um, after like a year at Miami University, I started to rack up some college debt and um, I had the intention of house hacking and I really wanted to. And I started to learn that the more college debt that you accumulate, it it hurts um, your ability to be eligible for loans when you get your W-2 when you're done. So I was like, all right, I decided to move home. Uh, I moved out of my parents' house when I was like 20. I just moved in a little tiny apartment. I drove DoorDash for 60 to 80 hours a week, and I just saved up a whole bunch of money, was taking like part-time classes, still pursuing my degree, but um, I really had the love for wanting to house hack because I started watching some YouTube videos. Just, that was kind of my initial journey into real estate, understanding that you know you can live in one side, run out the other, and and in a lot of cases, the other rent covers your mortgage and you can save that thousand bucks a month or whatever it is to pursue something else in the future, whether that's something for passive income or something else. So that was extremely important to me. Um, so saving up money for that, that was in 2020. So I did that for about a year. And then as I was getting, as I was getting closer, as I was trying to get two years of uh, the same income of tax returns, um, that way I can get eligible for a loan in 2021. I hopped on bigger pockets. I'm, I feel like a lot of you probably are familiar with that website. It's awesome. Um, I met Remington Lyman, who's a realtor in Columbus, Ohio, and he primarily helps first time investors, out of state investors, house hackers, all that stuff. And I basically read like, I read like at least like five bigger pockets books. I was, constantly in the forums, asking some questions. And then I had Remington as a really good resource, more local to Ohio. And that, you know, really helped me grow in that journey of trying to buy my first property. So also in 2021, I decided to move colleges again. I didn't, I kept switching, but I learned that um, I wanted a house hack and take advantage of appreciation as well. I was really looking at like where I'm from, Cleveland, Ohio, there's actually a slight population decline in a lot of the areas. So that doesn't really produce a long-term appreciation for real estate. And I learned that Columbus has a much brighter future. Like Intel, for example, is building a $20 billion uh, chip manuf manufacturing plant with projections of bringing $100 billion to central Ohio. So I knew I wanted to take advantage of that because that's just going to help property values go up, especially if it's in a decent area. So I was like, all right, I'm just going to go to Ohio State now. It's still a cheap school. going to go there, go to House Hack. So I went there, um, switched schools. So that was in the beginning of the school year last year. And this was like the big crucial moment for me when it came to real estate. I went into Remington's office, actually, because... I don't know, I was, really, I was really interested in all the systems he had in place. He was leveraging, I could tell he was leveraging like virtual assistants, um, doing different things like that. But the most important thing there was I, it took me a while, it took th two to three months, but I really learned how to find real estate deals. Like, and when I say deal, that means like it has equity on it. And that means, let's say there's a proper, like 
say your subject property and the property next to it sold for 200,000. And I cold call the subject property and the guy's like, it's distressed, you know, needs new furnaces, needs to be updated a bit. I'll take a hundred K for it. And then I'm, and you just do the math. It's like, I pay a hundred thousand. Let's say it needs 50,000 at work. And then you got to borrow some money. So you have to pay interest. You have to pay your debt service as well. But all in all, there might be like 40,000 of equity on that deal. So, and those opportunities are generally tough to find in competitive markets. Um, or in general, they're almost always off market. So you go and direct a seller. So I learned a ton of strategies doing that. Cold calling, cold texting, cold, like calling agents, asking if they have any off market deals, looking at people's purchase histories and figuring out what they like things like that. And you can figure out, you know, where they're finding their deals and you can try to learn from them. But I was cold calling like six, eight hours a day. I was doing it very intensely and I found some deals, made some money. And I learned that, you know, if I got my real estate license that I could take this to a whole nother because I could start to represent buyers, represent sellers make it a full-time job. And I was seeing the money that people were making around me. There were kids making like 50,000 a month, 20,000 a month. And they're like 25 or 22. And I was just like amazed. I'm like, so I'm not a huge fan of college, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. I think it makes sense for a lot, a lot of people. But for me, I was like, why am I going in debt and doing something I don't like to make less money than what these guys are doing? So for me, it made sense to go 100% at it. So um, I was basically just balancing uh, my Ohio State classes. And then I got my real estate license at the beginning of 2022. So about a year ago. And I had built up a pretty good pipeline of sellers because I've been cold calling them for a while. And then I started using like, start, I started to find buyers from bigger pockets, which is a really good source. Uh, LinkedIn, Facebook also from the people I cold called and I got a bunch of, I got a bunch of deals and contracts. It seems like a lot of you guys know what that means. So I terminated my first 11 deals. So that was brutal from January to March. I didn't make any money. I terminated 11 straight deals and I was like, man, this is brutal, but you know, you just got to take every opportunity and anything in front of you is like an opportunity to learn and to figure out what you can do differently next time. So you don't run into it again. Josh, and, yep. can you explain what that means, your first 11 deals? Yes. So I let's say I found a duplex for like 200000 or something, and somebody likes it. So they put an offer in. The seller agrees. Now we're, now we're in contract. So the inspector, the next thing that would happen is you get an inspection. This is usually what would happen. I wouldn't know the property very well. The uh, inspector would come and there'd be a whole bunch of issues or I didn't have a very good buyer or they weren't like financed properly, but the deal fell through. It was like they, the buyer ended up terminating. They didn't actually buy the property. And if you're an agent, it takes a lot of, a lot of time to get something in contract. And the only way you make money is when something closes. So I had spent three months like putting these together building the systems to do that. And they all fell out and it was a lot of failure, but I, uh, I learned a lot. I took like a whole bunch of notes. Like why did this fail terminate? All right, let's make sure we don't run into this situation again. And after that, like it just, it just took off. So, uh, I started to sell like three proper, like the next month was like three properties, then eight then 10, and 15 and it just took off and i ended up selling last year uh 135 properties right around there and then i know you guys want to invest i'll talk about that too but i was talking about the agent side so i sold about 135 properties almost 18 million gross for an agent that is usually what they do in their first five years so i did it in my first year and 80 percent of them don't uh 80% of them make like 10 grand or less their first year. It's something like that. So it was really cool to, you know, go from terminating 11 deals to that, basically doing that in the, the back nine months of the year. 
So yeah, I was able to make a good chunk of money um, and establish myself as an agent, find a job that, you know, pays well. Um, is there any questions that you had on the agent side, Dan, or anything that I could expand on that? And then I can talk about my investing. Or anybody else? Dare just put a question in there. What things did you find you weren't doing right? Uh, they're right. All right, cool. Uh, what was I not doing right? So number one, I wasn't vetting my buyers very well. Um, that was huge. Just because somebody signs a piece of paper or just because you can get somebody to sign a piece of paper in some ways doesn't mean they're actually going to close. So you end up wasting a lot of your time and their time. So I'm trying to not talk too abstract. Examples of that would be somebody that, you know, they don't, they're not actually pre-approved. They don't have the funds. Maybe they, you know, you haven't given them like a base set of knowledge. Like a lot of these people, it was their first investment or first out-of-state investment. There's a lot that goes into that. So um, things that I kind of did to get around that was like introducing them to like their team, right? The core four, the bigger pockets talks about, um, that was huge. Something else that I didn't do, um, conditions of properties was huge. Like I don't really go to properties. I don't show them very much. I don't really drive by. So especially like after I know the sellers for a little bit, but in the beginning I was just dealing with kind of shady guys that they would just pick up. They, whoever called them, they talked to. And that's usually not a great sign because they're either desperate or they might be lying. Uh, yeah. So one thing is making sure you vet your buyers out, vet your sellers out. Um, I think those two things are huge, honestly. Of those, of those 100 plus properties that you, that you brokered as an agent, right? Uh, yep. How many of them were out of, out of state and how many of them were out of Columbus? So it was about 60% Cleveland, 40% Columbus and 90. 95% of the buyers are out of state. It's almost everybody. Okay. So you were, uh, the, the properties were all in, all in Ohio between Cleveland and Columbus, but yes. a lot of, yep. a lot of people on bigger pockets looked, including myself, by the way, who are in expensive markets, look to the Midwest, look to Ohio, look to Cleveland and Columbus where they can buy properties for way less money. So they're looking to invest out of state. So you, you connect with the buyers probably through bigger pocket, bigger pockets forums and, and, yep. and groups there after you found properties in Ohio. And so you match those out of state investors with properties in Ohio. That's awesome. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, I saw, I see the next question. How did you go about finding the team to work with? The Remington was huge. So that's why I put his name in there, Remington Lyman. He's on bigger pockets. So like he had a huge Rolodex with property managers, lenders, special con like like different types of contractors, carpenters, painters, anything like you name it. It was all on there. So I kind of stepped into his Columbus platform because he had a really good Columbus team and I'm from Cleveland and I kind of mimicked what he had set up and I built it in Cleveland, but it's, um, if you think about kind of in sales, a general, a good thing to think about is eliminating as many barriers as you can for the consumer to the sale. So like a thing you can do in real estate is connecting them with their team right away. So like if you're an agent and you find a good property, like this is a good off market deal. Like there's maybe like 20 grand of equity on here or something, but if they don't, if it's an out state investor, they don't have a property manager they're comfortable with and they don't have an inspector that they're comfortable with. Those things might prevent them from taking that opportunity. So if you can set that up already, you just make the process way easier. And so would you say that meeting Remington changed everything for you? Uh, it, yeah, it changed a lot for sure. I learned okay. a lot from him. 
And and how did you meet Remington? Bigger Pockets forums. Um, he just messaged me, and then I hopped on a Zoom call with him. Yeah. So my point there was because you kind of already said that was before you hopped on, I was talking to all the members about opportunities start presenting themselves when you put yourself out there. And so you yes. put yourself out there on bigger pockets. You got into the forums. You were probably posting a little bit in the forums, connected with Remington, as well as many other people who didn't change your life. But you happened to connect with Remington, who was local with you. You met him for coffee or lunch. And then everything changed with that one connection, but it only happened because you were there to meet him. Uh, and that, and that's, yep. so before you hopped on, Josh, I was talking about one of our members who's here today, Taylor, because he's putting himself out there partially one way in this community. I'm now going to connect him with Scott Trench, who's kind of a friend of mine. And Scott's going to become his mentor and help him invest in a business. Maybe. I mean, a lot of things have to get worked out. Those things only happen if you're out there kind of shaking hands and, and, and meeting people and met, most often doing things that you're uncomfortable with. Um, even putting a post in the Bigger Pockets forums or in the Sheik's Freaks community, for some that might be uncomfortable. Like, what are people going to think if I ask this question? Who cares? Just ask it or just just respond to someone's post. Just just start taking start engaging and taking some action. So just wanted to hammer that point, Josh, that, you know, a lot of this is a great point to the fact that you were you were out there seeking connections and information. Um, yes, that's so, uh, yeah, I'm an introvert. Like I, I like hanging out by myself, working out by myself. So it's it's hard for me, too. But. I mean, just try to figure out a way to just not care. Just put yourself out there and, you know, you're going to get good. You're going to get bad, but it, it's usually going to pay off exponentially. Like you won't even know what's going to happen. Um, Benjamin said, how did you find most of your buyers and sellers? Uh, Bigger Pockets forums. If you go on, if you look me up on there, I have a thousand posts. I made a thousand posts in about three months or four months. So I was doing it a lot, but I accumulated a huge like a huge list of buyers on there and sellers. Um, so, and LinkedIn, I have a whole bunch of posts on LinkedIn, Facebook also, those are all good. And then a lot of them just from cold calling too. Those are kind of my main four sources. How did you handle the volume of transactions? Um, so basically this is a really good principle. You can apply in anything in business or investing or whatever is if you have to do the same thing twice, you should never have to do it again. So just write down everything you're doing in a day, figure out a way to create a procedure for it and then delegate it. So that's all that I did. Like, I don't really, I don't write contracts. I don't, I don't really write emails. There's a, I use a ton of text templates. So I use, I use procedures. So like creating templates of things you do a bunch and then I delegate them to virtual assistants. So I have uh, two full-time virtual assistants they work about a hundred, about a hundred hours a week. They like working. So, and uh, they're from the Philippines, and their uh, standard of uh, living is much lower than than uh, ours is in the United States. So, I pay them like eight bucks an hour, and that's like twenty five dollars an hour for them over there. So they love it. So, but it's way cheaper to to do that and to have a team versus like hiring somebody. Um, yeah, that's. Those are basically how I did that. Um, would you say what really helped you succeed as an agent is because you treated being an agent as a business? Yes. Yeah. So thinking about figuring out ways to remove all the barriers to the sale. So like I said, a few of them earlier, another one is like getting pre-approved. It's like, all right, as soon as I onboard them, like as soon as I get their email, I'm introducing them to a lender. And I'm CCing the lender with a big text email template and the lender's responding. And then I'm going to follow up with them every three days or whatever. Hey, did you reach out to the lender? Did you get pre-approved? Like I hop on a Zoom call with them immediately and I have some goals of what I'm trying to get. Like what, what are your goals as an investor? What experience do you have? You know, what are your expectations? That's huge for investors. You should, like if you're an agent, 
figuring out what someone's expectations are is massive because there's some people out there that are like, I only buy deals that have 30% cash and cash returns. And it's like, all right, you're probably not going to find a deal for them, but there's plenty of people, plenty of people that'll buy things like 10%, 12%, 8%. That's where you can make money. So um, that's big. Yes, having a team is huge. Um, it's a very good value add. Um, Definitely. How do I track my relationships and stay on top of your deadlines? I use a CRM called Follow Up Boss, um, but I mean, any of them work. I just, I mean, to give you an example, I sent 75,000 texts last year. I don't use my phone, it's all through my CRM, but that's a lot. I sent over 100,000 emails. Um, I create tasks to follow up with people consistently. I'm trying to figure out a way to, to sum up a CRM. Um, I mean, it's really just about like procedures. So like onboarding a client, like, is this a high client? Like, are they, are they wanting to buy now? It's like, all right, I'm going to make sure I'm sending them like five good deals every day for the next five days and asking them for feedback from, for all of them. So I can further figure out what they're looking for. Maybe somebody's three months out, but you don't want to do that for someone who's three months out. Cause you're just gonna, you're kind of, you're going to annoy them or, I don't know, or it's not productive. It's all of those things. So then you create a timeline that makes more sense to where you're at that point in three months. Some people are a year out or six months out. Um, yeah, that's good. Let me talk about my investing really quickly. So I also bought 10 properties as well. I didn't own any real estate in 2021. I bought 10 last year, seven of them. I just looked to make sure seven of them I bought with less than five grand of my own money. The total between all the 10 was is like a million and 1.8 million. That's like the value something like that. They're Cleveland properties, so they're cheaper, but it's 20 doors, 10 duplexes. So the way that I learned how to buy all of those, I think it's, I think cold calling is huge. If you're trying to buy deals, like just go on prop stream. Like if you're trying to house hack a duplex in your area, just pull a list of like everybody that owns a duplex in an area. And just cold call them and try to have conversations with those owners. That's all I did. So I was like, like a lot of people that cold call, they're gonna be like, hey, like, are you the owner of one, two, three East Main Street? How much do you want for that? And they're like, who are you? I don't want to sell. Like, you like stop. Um, I try to develop like relationships with them. So I would be like, hey, like, I see you own this. Um, how did you get to buy that? You know, tell me your story. Do you own other real estate? Like I'm, I'm 22. I'm trying to buy deals myself and I got a much, I think I got a better like rate of return on response that way for sure. But I got an opportunity to meet like investors that owned hundreds, if not like thousands of units. How did you find those properties? I'm getting to that. I'm just trying to like show how I figured that out. So like I met with a guy, his name's Alex. He owns a th over a thousand units in Columbus. Most of them are in Columbus. He's like 38. That's crazy. And like, that's like, a, it's like a, over a million dollars a month in passive income. And like the dude is just sitting at his desk with his kid, like in like an office. And like, he let me meet him. I'm like, this is crazy. Like, how does someone even get to this point? And like, I learned a lot of things from him. So like, a few key points that I learned from a guy like that is <clears throat> a lot of real estate is solving people's problems. Like that's like finding deals is solving people's problems. So like, and I'll, I'll, I'll think of an example. That's one. Another one is there's money everywhere. There's guys that have a whole bunch of money in their bank, whether it's 50 K a hundred K, whatever it is that if you show some history of buying real estate yourself, and successfully doing deals, if you present like, hey, look, here's some deals that I did. Like, would you want to loan me? Like, I found a duplex over here that needs to be fixed. Can I borrow your money for six months? I'll fix it up, refinance it, and I'll give you a 10% of your money. People that will take that. You just got to ask. So um, I'll go through quickly on how I bought every deal. So the first one was hard money. Hard money loan is basically like if you have a credit score and a heartbeat and some money in the bank, they'll give you money. It's high. It's like 
it's like I paid three points and 12% interest and I held it for six months. So um, that deal, I had the most money out of pocket. It was a duplex for 80,000. And if you know what an ARV is after a pair of value, there was two on the same street that sold for 160. And this thing needed about 30 to $40,000 of work. So there's a good $40,000 spread there. So that's why I did the deal. So the, the, the hard money lender, a lot, this is pretty standard. They'll give you 70% of the ARV and upfront capital between your purchase price and your rehab costs. So basically it shook down to me having to bring 10% to the deal. So I brought like 11,000 to the table, but I'm, I'm also a real estate agent. So I actually can apply my commission as a down payment. So I talked to the seller and I was able to uh, actually increase my commission. The standard commission is like 3%. I built in like 6% of the deal and then applied all that to the down payment. So I was less than like 5K out of pocket on that one. Um, does, that, does that make sense, Dan? I'm trying to explain it in a good way. All right, cool. So yeah, that it was vacant. So I had, I had contractors go in there. I bought it sight unseen. I, I didn't see it. I found a contractor that I trusted. He fixed up both sides. Um, I re my cost between purchase price, rehab and interest, my all in was like 120 and I refinanced it. And the bank's ARV was 155 because the market did has gone down since the beginning of last year. So, um, and I got a bank to finance at an 80% LTV. So the, the bank gave me like 125,000 back, something like that. And I had to, I had to pay my hard money lender one, 110 or sorry, like 115. And I had five in the deal and the new bank was giving me 125. So at close, they paid off that debt. I got this 5k back and then I got another 5k back. I, I pulled out five grand and the property makes about $500 a month. I don't have any of my own money invested. So that's a free $500 a month, every month, as, like as soon as I rented it out. So that was the first deal. The second deal was four duplexes, very similar as the first one. It was a hard money, it was a hard money um, loan with the same hard money lender, but I also used private money. So I found a guy that had like, he had like 100K in his bank. He really wanted to buy real estate, but he was really nervous to buy something. He was like in his forties and he just like, I don't know, I couldn't get him to convert, but I talked to him. I was like, Hey, I just did this deal. Like, um, would you consider, you know, I need like 30 grand here for this deal for me to do these four duplexes. I'll give you 12% on your money and you'll get it back in six months. And the guy was like, sure. And that was my down payment. So I bought those four duplexes zero dollars out of pocket um i sold one in the process of selling the other and i'll refinance the other two and i'll probably i'll pull some money out but those will end up being free deals also that also cash flow about two to three hundred dollars per unit um all right i'll answer these questions because they're popping up did you refinance with the bank yes i so i don't have two years of um, the same tax returns, which I'm sure a lot of you guys run into as well when you're younger, or even just having income history. So I decided to go with a portfolio bank. So the rates are a little bit higher. I refied at like 8%. It's not great, but they hold their own notes. That's important because they don't have to abide by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac standards because your normal bank, your big banks, your, your, your uh, little banks, most of them are taking your notes and just selling them immediately. So like when you close in your house, they finance it for you and then they just sell the note to Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and then they make a little bit of a difference. That's usually what happens. But portfolio banks, they hold their own notes. They don't have to abide by their standards. So I had a good amount of money in my bank and they had this, they have this weird process where they take your money in the bank divided by 33 and that's considered active income. And that was enough to cover the debt service for everything that I was buying. So that's why they were able to refinance those. Um, the next two deals, they were also value add duplexes. Um, it 
they were different transactions, but financed the same way. I've got these both from a private money lender. Same thing. This is actually a lender that I worked with consistently. And I was telling them about these. I, I was like, hey, like I'm finding all these deals. I really want to do more. Like here's the spread. There's an opportunity here. And I convinced him to, to do with me. So he actually went to his bank. So he's a, he's a mortgage broker at a bank. And he went to the bank, pulled out big lines of credit, and he loaned it to me, uh, unsecured. Well, no, sorry. It's secured debt. Um, it's uh, 10%, two points, also expensive, but same thing, six months only. And they both have enough spread for me to justify taking that risk. So both of those deals, same thing. I'm still finishing up the rehabs, but when I refinance those, I'll pull out some cash and they'll make two, 300 bucks a month each unit. Um, what was the other deal? That's probably enough. You guys get the idea. But um, a few key points, I think, in buying real estate early on when you don't have the income history, you don't have hundreds of thousands in your bank to just buy deals. Number one is finding deals with equity. So finding a deal where the current value plus the, the value needed to get the ARV is a lot less than what it's going to be worth. You guys have seen the Burr strategy. That's basically all I'm doing. The Burr strategy, that's how you scale quickly. That's what I've learned from the guys that own hundreds, if not a thousand units. So um, you said, what are the cons of using a hard money lender? You don't want to hold, uh, it's expensive debt and you got to make sure that you're confident enough in your team and your contractors to get the jobs done. Because when that note's up, man, you got to, you got to pay. So like, they're going to, they'll go after you. So like, like make sure you, so like I remotely uh, manage all of my rehabs because I live in Columbus. All the deals that I've bought so far have been in Cleveland. It's it's like a two hour drive, but I mean, I've only been there like four times. I've barely been there. So like making sure that you have a good contracting team that you trust in place, that's a whole nother discussion, but I'd be happy to answer questions on that. Um, do you use some kind of promissory note to borrow that down payment? So I was making good money from uh, selling properties. So I had money in the bank, but I mean, when it all comes down to it, like if I add up all the down payments for all 10 properties, it's it's not that much. And you could probably get like a family member or somebody to cover some of that. Um, yeah. Okay, can you talk a little bit more about how you finance deals without consistent work history? So. That's where like hard money lending comes in as really helpful. It's it's risky because it's high debt and you you have to either sell the asset or refinance it or pay it off whenever the end of it is. Usually they'll loan lend it to you on a six, nine, or twelve month basis. So it's extremely important that if you're gonna go that route, you have to buy deals that have equity. Like I just I keep saying that, but that's like I've seen people that don't but buy deals with enough spread and then they go to refinance and they end up having to pay, they end up paying more for the property than what it's worth. But like hard money lenders or private money lenders, you don't really need like a huge income history. You just need like a decent credit score, like 650 or 600 even, and like 20,000 in your bank or 10,000 in your bank. That's like the, the bottom line. I mean, that's, I, I haven't learned how to buy a lot of deals with less than 20 grand in your bank. I mean, the best route for that is to try to go seller financing or leveraging your uh, leveraging like hard money with a partner who has capital. Like, don't be afraid. Another, another key point, like the four duplexes, that was with a partner. So don't be afraid to bring partners in. I know it's annoying because you're giving up half of what you could be making. Well, you're, you're also providing yourself half of an opportunity you wouldn't have without it. So um, don't be afraid to partner as well. Let's see. How do you know when you have a good contractor before hiring them? Well, figure out, uh, ask them for their work. Like, hey, show me like a few properties that you worked on. 
and maybe they send you before pictures and after pictures. Most people will take that as like, oh, great, let's do it. That's good. Go the extra, go the extra step. Look up the owner of that property and call them. Hey, how was your experience with this contractor? Would you suggest them? And, you know, go through like a few, like have them send you a few different, um, a few different like projects that they've done. You know, that's, that's kind of how I did it. Okay. Am I misunderstanding that when you refinance a 30 year bank loan, you work history? So the portfolio banks, they didn't even really look at my tax return. They looked at, they didn't really look at it, honestly. They just need to make sure that you do file taxes, but they care about the, do you having enough money in your bank? So if you aren't, what I would suggest, if you aren't working a job where you're accumulating money in your bank quickly, or you already have a lot of money in your bank, just fix up the property and sell it and pocket the, 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 the profit, right? So like the first duplex that I did, because I had money in the bank, I was able to refinance it, but I could have just sold it and then pocketed that 20, 30,000, whatever it is, and then use that, you know, to have money in the bank to re refinance something. So I'll just jump in real quick, just so everyone's yeah, clear. Yeah. What, what Josh is, <laughs> this is really impressive, Josh, but, you know, I think, I think someone's asking you questions uh, and they're sending them directly to you because I'm not seeing them on my screen, oh, which, is, oh. which is totally fine. But the person asking the questions is, is kind of asking, how did you get the portfolio loan, which, which you would only get if you're going to keep the property as an investment property for yourself? So the Josh point. said, well, before you do that, basically do a couple flips, or if you're an agent, do a couple deals, bank that money. So you have that money in the bank so that you can either A, pay for that deal yourself, or you qualify for lending from a private lender or a hard money lender or a portfolio lender. Um, now, this is all, I just want to point this out to everybody because most people in this community, but not all, are, are interested in house hacking or are house hacking. Everything Josh is talking about, which is amazing stuff, is not the house hacking route. So you, you do have to have 20, 25% of equity in a deal to refinance it. The bank needs to see that much. If you're house hacking and you're going to live there for a year as a primary residence, one of the best benefits about that option is that your down payment can be as low as three and a half to 5%, a lot less money to get started, uh, which is why house hacking is so great for young people. Now, both, both paths work. You get to pick which one you want to try um, to get your investing career started. Um, this is great stuff, Josh. I want to ask a couple other questions since I interrupted mm -hmm. so rudely. Uh, going back, you know, kind of when you were in beginning in college and maybe even at the end of high school, where do you think you got this this mindset or this drive to succeed? I know it kind of happened over time. You were in school for IT, and then you kind of slowly decided, well, that's not for me. I'm going to go this route, you know, after you started exploring real estate. But where do you think that came from? And, and were your parents into real estate at all or entrepreneurship at all? Yeah. So, I mean, I've always been very competitive. Uh, I was a good basketball player. Um, I don't know. I played year round basketball for eight years throughout high school. I was on good AAU teams. I've played with a few NBA players now that were on my team then, a bunch of college players. So I kind of always had that mentality of, you know, trying to be the best at whatever I'm doing. Another weird thing is you have a pro Fortnite player too, uh, totally left field. But I don't know. Whenever I found something that I liked, I always try to be the best at it. That's just kind of my overall mindset. And my parents, no, they... My uh, my mom is very artsy. She doesn't want to do any of that. And my dad is very conservative. He's a financial advisor, but he's just like, take your money, throw it in S and P. Don't buy real estate; it's risky. Like he's no nowhere near it. So, and like I didn't have any grandparents that did it either. Um, no, nah, I just kind of just jumped. I was like that first deal that I I was scared. I was thinking like forty thousand in rehab. Like that's so much money. Like I can't just like come up with that if something's wrong, but you know, like I took that deal and I presented it to 
the investors around me, like Remington. Remington owns like 80 units. And I was like, hey, like, what do you, do you think this is worth giving it a shot? He's like, yeah, it's a good deal. I'd buy that. And like, I asked a bunch of other people. So like, find a reliable network, trust them, trust yourself, and like make sure you're asking like a lot of questions. Um, I don't know. I love that. You know, you just said find a reliable network, which really just means find some people you trust that you can yeah. lean on, that you can ask questions to. Um, and I keep harping on this, but that's what this, I'm talking to my members now, that's what this community is all about. And that's what the bigger pockets community is all about. And that's why I'm telling you to get out there and meet other people because what, I, I think, you know, when Josh went to Remington, that's his name. Yep. Remington and said, Hey, look at this deal. I'm thinking about buying this. Would you buy it? And he trusted Remington. Remington's an experienced, successful investor. Remington said, yeah, I would buy that. That looks like a good deal to me. I mean, that was probably like a huge weight off your shoulders yeah. of doubt. Doubt is gone now and it's still scary without a doubt, but you have kind of the, the blessing or the approval of someone who's way more experienced than you. If you if you're not putting yourself out there and engaging and networking, then it's it's hard to find those people to lean on and ask questions to. Um, yep. So another question I had uh, was, how did your parents feel about, because I, I think you said you did then, you stopped, did you graduate from college? Did you get the degree? No. Yeah, so how did your parents <laughs> handle that? Uh, they... I don't know. They're they're totally good with it now, but <laughs> I mean, I'll just I'll just be honest. Like, I made like 200k in like four months, and I was like, dude, I'm not going back. And like, I just I was, it started ramping up, and it was getting more. So, um, my philosophy is don't don't jump from your current boat until your next one's better. So I don't know. That's I kind of waited for that. Awesome. Um, so I think you've covered, you know, a lot of great stuff around how you built your agent business, um, and, and the details there. And then also how you're starting to build your investment portfolio. Uh, and so I, you know, we've been doing this already, but I think we're going to officially switch gears to member questions. I saw there were some new ones in the chat. Um, Lupe yeah. said, I'll, yeah. I'll address some of them. Um, yep. Are there any things you would have done differently? I guess I haven't really thought of that because I mean, honestly, the last year of my life has been kind of crazy. I just went from one place to a completely different place. Um, what would I do differently? I probably would. People always say buy real estate then wait. I st I'm only a year into this and I still feel like I should be buying more. So uh, don't be afraid to buy. Um, that's I guess that's one thing I would say. Um, and you're buying real estate when a lot of people, a lot of people out there are saying, don't buy right now. It's too high. Yes. It's too big. It's too expensive. Yeah. Interest rates are going up. Uh, prices are going to come down. The, the real estate market is going to crash. You know, there, I, I, someone had this saying, it was in a Bigger Pockets podcast. They said, there's two great times to buy real estate now and 10 years ago. And that's yep. kind of always true. Uh, and you can't do it 10 years ago. So you might as well just go ahead and buy now. Um, yep. All right. Yeah. There's a couple more in there, I think. And, yeah. and members, if you want to put your members, you want to put your questions in the chat, or if you want to raise your virtual hand, I will see it and I'll call on you either one. All right. The next one was, seems like you strategically looked for duplexes. That's just my, that's <clears throat> honestly where I saw opportunity in my market. I'm sure it's completely different in all of yours, but I noticed like the the two to four unit space in Cleveland, there's a lot of them. And of that, the inventory breakdowns, 80% duplex, 10% tri and quad. So there's just way more duplexes. The people are very used to renting them and there's good comps to support rehabs. So that's that's basically it. Like maybe your market has a ton of single family opportunity or four unit opportunity. I would just try to find it and do it. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. I don't know. Um, I, don't I have another question. Yeah, go I have ahead. another question for you. Then there's a couple more in there. So some of the members aren't interested in real estate. They don't want to be an agent and maybe they don't even want to be an investor. But I think what, what you are showing is when there's drive, when there's will, when there's ambition 
And when you're willing to put yourself out there, even if you are introvert, you can find success. So kind of an open-ended question, but what advice would you give to someone who's looking to take it to the next level, um, no matter what that venture might be? For sure. I would say find someone in your niche that is doing better than you. Be humble and just try to see what you can learn from them. You know, like Remington, I just walked in his office and I was like, hey, like, can I just shadow you and watch what you're doing for a little bit? Like, whatever it is, just try to cling yourself to somebody doing it, doing it successfully and well. And if you think the thing I've noticed is like, younger successful people is they're they're like they're hungry and it, like for me like i would love like i have mentees like people like college students i'm trying to build up like if you're enthusiastic and you want to learn and you want to grow like i love that energy so like go to like i don't know try to find people in your niche um just reach out like don't underestimate the value that you can provide that's another thing too like I would go in that office. I was like, man, like, I don't, I don't know anything about real estate. What am I going to do here? But they were like, hop on the phones, find a deal. And I found a few deals and I helped make them money because they found deals and it just kind of went from there. Um, you'll quickly find where you can pr provide value. Just try to put yourself out there a little bit. Um, what kind of broker did you go for when you became an agent? Uh, it just depends on what you're trying to attack, right? I like working with investors. Uh, out of state are cool too. So um, just go to your market and find somebody, find the big players that are doing well and just get in there, figure out how you can provide value. I mean, if you can find off-market deals, I mean, they, they love that. So uh, that's all I can really say about that. <laughs> what year were your duplexes built? Cleveland's old. Uh, between like 1920 and 1950, 1960. So people are scared of that, but I'm not. It's fine. Um, what are your future plans? Uh, honestly, I am still trying to figure that out. My goal is to have a thousand units. So I got a lot of, I got a lot of many to go, but I'm slowly learning how to do that. I'm trying to buy some more commercial buildings. Um, my goal is to make a million, over a million dollars in commission this year. So um, those are a few goals that I have. Are late 1800s. Yes, there are some properties in Ohio that are late 1800s. Those are in the pretty poor areas, spots that I uh, try to avoid. Um, another thing you can do if you, this is also, this is huge. If you wanna work with investors and they don't know your market very well, and you know your market well, make a graded map. I have a very detailed graded map of Cleveland, A class, B class, C class, D class, the whole thing. Um, I think that's huge. That's a lot of people have worked with me just because of that. Um, yeah. Is that something, Josh, that you could pull up right now? And yeah, show yeah, it? yeah, uh, it's right here. Sorry, I have a lot of screens. Oh yeah, I have a lot of monitors too. It's very helpful. Um, so yeah, like I have one for Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, but it's basically A through D. And I basically tell people the advantages and disadvantages of investing in each. They're kind of based on like property values, crime rates, uh, vacancy rates, all the stuff that kind of goes into grading neighborhoods. But this is huge. You just um, you just create like boxes and label them. It's not that hard. It takes a while, but this is a great resource um, if you're an agent. And if you're like, you know, if you're just investing like yourself, uh, I'll put the link here if anybody wants it for your own, uh, to mimic it. I think I accidentally, like even, even if you're investing yourself, like if you're trying to learn the areas, right? Like you might forget, like go drive over there and then be like, oh, maybe this is like B class or C class and put it on a map. What, what is your, uh, Josh, when you, when, you, when you find an off-market deal and you, and you broker the deal with the out-of-state out of investor, mm -hmm. these Cleveland properties 
aren't worth a lot. So what is your average commission on a deal, would you say? Uh, it's around 5,000. So I try to represent buyer and seller. So you get, you get both sides. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's right around there. Okay. It's interesting because in Colorado, where properties are so much more expensive. Sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> um, yeah. And, and, but, you know, you just, you do more of them and you're still making great money. Yeah. Uh, just got to do a lot. How do you pull comps? Um, wait. Oh, what, what, what software do I use? You can just search like, I don't know, a zip code, crime rates, drive over there yourself. Search, just search like the area. I don't really use, I just, it was just kind of accumulation of a bunch of stuff. Um, how do I pull comps? I'm an agent, so I have access to the MLS. That's where I pull most of my comps. Um, and then sometimes I'll go to uh, the auditors, the county auditors and pull comps on there. Not, not all of them allow for that, but that's good too. Lupe has a question. Yeah, hey Josh, sorry I'm not on video. Uh, my question hey. was focused on, because uh, Dan mentioned in, in an email that you aim to create enough passive income with real estate to start projects and create large affordable housing and apartment buildings. So I'd love for you to speak to that. Um, maybe like the, the reasoning behind uh, building affordable housing. Is that something sure. that you still... Oh yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I didn't make that up. I just didn't get into it. I mean, <laughs> I just, I see, I've like, look historically at what real estate can do to an area. It's just really cool how you can build, you can just build buildings and like transform like a, a local micro economy. So I'd love to, you know, leverage like tax benefits that the city and state and government, federal government gives you to, you know, build really big buildings and provide a lot better housing for people. Because a lot of the properties that I'm s selling or like seeing, like it's a lot, a lot of it's low income and it hurts. It literally hurts me to like, see how like some people live. Like, don't be like a, don't, don't be like an ignorant. There's a lot of ignorant investors that like buy properties and they fill them with tenants. They don't really care about them. And they're not managed very well. So my goal is to try to like eliminate as much of that as possible because I see it on a daily basis and it just, it could be done a lot better for sure. All right. We're, uh, we're kind of at the, the end of our time, Josh, I want to thank you and say uh, awesome job. Uh, thanks for joining us. I know you're super busy. Um, yeah. Amazing stuff. And congrats on all your success. Uh, thank you. Gloria put in there, and I agree 100% with her. Congrats on all the hustle, or she said, "Mad respect." Yeah, for all the hustle. <laughs> I uh, like it. Yeah, um, just uh, just work hard. That's the majority of what's and starts learn about leverage. That helps too. <laughs> yeah, uh, um, takes a lot of hours, like you said. For a while, you were oh, you were cold yeah, calling. I was. Eight hours I mean, from day. January, sorry, from September 21 to. Like June 22, I was working 80 hours a week, actually 80 hours a week, like in the office at six, home at nine, like six days a week. And then like on Sundays too, it's not that, I mean, I didn't do a whole lot, but I would rather, I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of you guys are like this too. Like I'd rather, you know, suck it up for a few years and then live the rest of your life much better. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm going to let you go, Josh. You can, you can jump off whenever you want and get back to crushing sure. it, which is what you're doing. Um, the rest of you, I got a couple wrap uh, things to wrap up and then we'll be good. Let me switch back over here. Uh, All right. I'll, uh, does anybody have any, any other questions for me? I'm happy to answer any of. If, uh, would you mind Josh throwing an email in the chat if they do oh, yeah, have yeah. a follow-up question? Yeah, that'd be good. Um, here and yeah, you can email or text me. All right. Uh, thanks everyone. I appreciate your time and, uh, get after it. Thank you. All right. Thanks Josh. Yep. See ya. All right, members. That was 
freaking awesome. The guy's 20, just turned 22. Uh, not, not to make you feel like you're not doing enough or you're not far away. Uh, I wouldn't compare yourself to him. I would just learn from a lot of the things he said and, and how hard he has worked. Uh, you don't have to work that hard, by the way. He said he worked 80 hours a week and he has crushed the last year. If 80 hours a week isn't your cup of tea, do 60 or 50. Just know it's going to take a little longer, but you will get there. You will find success. The key is you have to do the work. Um, when and how hard is up to you. Uh, I'm going to throw in the chat one more time the link to the Google form for the accountability groups. I don't, I forgot who it was. They threw in a great, I think I'm going to use it. It was, I wrote it down. Um, Goal getters groups or something like that. I like that name. Goal getters. Uh, so accountability groups, we'll have a couple week period where people can sign up because I'm going to reach out to everyone else. Then I'll, I'll pair people up and, and we'll get you going on those. Um, next, our next meeting is two weeks from tonight. That guest is Ryan Scribner, ex expert guest. He is more like general personal finance and investing. He's not a real estate guy. He might have a couple of investments, but that's not his thing. He's, he, and he's also a YouTuber. Like he creates great content. Um, and he has a huge, uh, he has a lot of subscribers to his YouTube channel. So that's two weeks from now. Um, also, as I always say, get in the community, get into the app, engage, you know, post, reply, like, post some pictures, just, you got to use the community. It is what it's, uh, you will get out of it, what you put into it. So if you're not engaging, you're not going to get anything out. But if you're in there and you're taking those, those, uh, you know, uncomfortable steps sometimes, or you're just putting yourself out, you never know what is going to happen uh, or who you might meet or what, what question you might get answered. So it's all up to you. It's all up to you. Um, always reach out to me if you have any questions, you want to chat about anything. Uh, I appreciate you all. And I'll see you in the community or I'll see you two weeks from tonight or both. Go out there and get your freak on everybody. Thanks. Bye guys. Thanks, Dan. There you go. Thanks. Hey, Dan, I uh, signed up for the membership, by the way. Awesome. Awesome. Good to hear it, Chase. Uh, so you have a 14-day free trial. You just signed up right, right now, right? So yeah. uh, once you signed up, download the app, check it out, meet some people, you know, uh, if it's not for you, that's totally fine, but hopefully it is. And, and you'll find what you're looking for and level up. Cool. Thank you. Yep. Good to meet you. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. Taylor, are you still there? You good to go? Yeah, Dan. I was about to leave. <laughs> um, I think I was at a bigger pockets meetup with you, and I, I think you met Scott Trench in person at that meetup, right? Yeah, were, yeah. So yeah, I no, we we talked a little bit. Um, got to introduce myself to him. It was can't I can't remember when that meetup was, but yeah, we did meet actually. Mm -hmm. So I will email both of you together and reintroduce you, and then you two can take it from there. Uh, I, I will tell you this, Scott was looking, he, he's told me he was looking for someone kind of early twenties, mid twenties, who, who had some college experience, like some, some college classes under their belt. So you don't fit exactly what he's looking for, but I think, I think you do. Um, once he kind of talks to you and, and sees what you're doing, uh, he'll understand that, you know, you if you're interested that it really could work out. Um, and I think it'll help that, you know, you are an agent, you have a couple properties, you work with the five team. He obviously knows Craig really, really well. Um, so, yeah. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. Right on. Yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah. Appreciate that. You bet. You bet. I'll talk awesome. to you later. All right. Yeah. Awesome. I'll talk to you later. It was awesome. Awesome. Uh, Zoom. Yeah. Josh was incredible. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, all right, I'll see you later. All right, see you, Taylor.